for many pastors, once you get into the fall, you kind of get a certain itch. You get a certain scent in the air. And you want to start doing evangelism. <laughs> I didn't even grow up Adventist, but if you come into an evangelical world or you grow up Christian, the fall is just kind of when you do evangelism. Um, it goes well with harvest, you know, and, and the, the season and, and everything like that. And so it, it's kind of just like you feel a change in the air and you just know um, the playoffs are here. <laughs> it's time to talk about evangelism. And I'm going to do, be doing that um, for a couple of sermons here um, just to give you an idea of where we're going. Now, everything we do as believers in Jesus Christ should have an evangelistic element to it. Uh, obviously, it's not all about you know, just us and our own discipleship and journey. We realize we're not an isolated uh, group. We have contacts with the others uh, outside of our walls. Um, but sometimes it's good to focus specifically on God calling us to reach our community. Um, I'm in my fifth year now here in Phoenix, in, in Arizona. Uh, came from Washington State, spent most of my time in the Pacific Northwest, um, and uh, in my fifth year, and it's still not uncommon for friends or, or church members or families to say, well, how are you liking Arizona? Some of you have asked me that, right? And, and many of you, too, aren't natives necessarily to Arizona, and so you may get the same questions over time as, as you talk with family. How are you liking the heat? How is Phoenix? Are you loving it? You know, you've asked these questions before. So over the years, you know, my wife and I have, you know, addressed that a lot about different ways of answering. We've, I think, uh, dealt with the heat fine. Um, that's obviously the biggest factor of living in this area. We, uh, coming from where it's cold, it's just the reverse, right? You stay indoors in the summer. You love your air conditioning. You want it to work. Whereas, uh, you know, when you're in the north, it's, you know, instead of zero degrees uh, in the winter, and you, you go inside and you stay warm. And so it's not that big a difference. We've dealt with the heat fine. I've learned to love the desert. I really have. The desert has its beauty. It has its blooms of season. My wife and I like to do a lot of walking, hiking. So we've kind of seen the, 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 the miracle of nature, and we like that. Can't say I love the driving. That's not my favorite thing about Phoenix. Um, uh, and, and having children learning to drive in this community is very nerve-wracking. Um, and, of course, we could tell lots of stories. Uh, we're kind of famous, I think, for our, our driving in Phoenix. I don't really like the politics of Arizona, just to be honest with you. I don't like being in a swing state. Um, whichever side you're on, I, that's fine. I'm just sick of the ads. <laughs> and it's like they never stop. It's, you know, uh, and they're so, they're so ugly, aren't they? You don't watch a political ad generally and are filled with joy. You're not, not generally. It's designed to make you angry, right? It's designed to make you motivated. I get it. So there's, there's that element. Um, but we've really come to love the people. There's a great mixture of people in, uh, in this area, in this territory. How do you answer that question? Do you love it? Do you not? Well, today I want to talk about loving Egypt. And I want to take this on a particular historical and geographical journey with you today through the Bible and through history and give you uh, some things to think about. So I do have my normal interactive time with the young people. So Jaden, you're on the case there. I don't know if that mic's working. You might want to grab one that for sure. Toby's favorite color, pink. There you go, buddy. <laughs> So I know we don't have as many of our young people, but I'd love your help. This is for our younger members. Uh, when you think of Egypt, certain things jump to mind. The king of Egypt had a particular title. Very unique, not a title that you're going to find anywhere else. What was the king of Egypt called? I see, okay, we've got... I, Pharaoh. He was called Pharaoh, right? And then anytime you hear the word Pharaoh... You know, you know it belongs to Egypt. You know, a king can be anywhere, an emperor can be anywhere, um, but certain titles are very much located within a particular group. Pharaoh, it just means the great house. Um, and so there are lots of different great houses that would rule through dynasties, through ancient Egypt. Um, and it could be male or female. It was not an ethnic thing. It was not a gender thing. There were female pharaohs. There were black pharaohs when the Ethiopians conquered um, Egypt for a short time. There were black pharaohs. 
So uh, if you happen to be the ruler of Egypt, um, you were the great house, you were Pharaoh. I'm going to get in trouble if I talk too much. Uh, but there's no potluck today, so we can stay as long as we want. No. What mighty river flowed through Egypt? It has a name. There's a mighty river. I see Francesca, and I see Eric. So Jaden is going to bring you the mic. The Nile River. Oh, I'm sorry, Francesca. Eric's too smart. <laughs> the Nile, okay? Major, major river in the world. One of the only major rivers that flows north. Very unusual for a river to flow north, just the way the world geography goes. Um, arguably the longest river. There's still debates about that. But obviously the life source of Egypt. It, it uh, influenced everything about Egypt. It influenced their religion, their politics, their seasons. Everything hinged on the Nile, as you can anticipate. Number three, the Bible has a lot of interactive time with Egypt. Who are the first Bible characters to visit Egypt? Who were the first Bible characters? Did you just sneeze? Don't hand her the mic. <laughs> I didn't we need sneeze. some sanitizer. No, I'm just... Abraham and Sarah. Oh, almost. Not quite. Ah, Fred Cheska. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Moses? You, you can't raise your hand and Moses? point at someone else. Moses? No, it wasn't Moses. A.B. really did get it right. Now she's giving me the eye. I, I'm really in trouble. I can see that. All right. So before they took on their additional parts of their names, they're known as Abram and Sarai. So, yeah. Now I want to pause. I, I do have a couple more questions, but I want you guys to notice something. This is kind of important to the entire theme of the sermon. God calls Abram out of the Mes out of Mes Mesopotamia, and he says, I'm going to bring you to a land, a promised land. It's going to be a great place. You're going to become a great leader in this place, and you need to trust me. Come on over to Canaan, right? And almost as soon as Abraham, well, there I did it myself, Abram gets to Canaan, he does a few things. He meets with a few people, builds a few altars. But by the time you get to verse 10 of Genesis 12, it says, and there was a drought in the land so bad that Abram had to leave. It's almost like, has anyone ever told you, oh, you need to come to this restaurant, best restaurant ever. Come to this restaurant, and you come to the restaurant, and it's like they're out of food. And it's like, why did you tell me about this place? You said it's great. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. God had a plan in this. Before God wanted Abram to become established as a great leader of Israel and of Canaan, he wanted him to get to know his neighbor first. God directed that Abram was to go into Egypt and he meets Pharaoh. This was the plan of God. God wanted Abram to have a relationship with Egypt. And Abram messed it up, if you remember the story. As a matter of fact, he has to get evicted out of Egypt and along the way, he picks up an Egyptian servant named Hagar that he later fathers a child through. Remember the story? But just keep that in mind. Very, very early in Bible history do you see a relationship attempting to be formed between Egypt and Israel, or Abram, the Hebrews. They have different names. Okay? All right, a couple more questions. What did Moses say to Pharaoh in Exodus 5, verses 1? Very famous phrase. What did Moses say to Pharaoh? Go down, Moses, and do something. I see... Oh, Eli? Let's give Eli a chance. Um, he didn't say, um. That would have been... Let my he did say... Can you put it in a song for me? Let my he did! I heard him! I mean, how many of you... Have, you you've all heard this song, Go Down, Moses... When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oh, the three of us that sang together, it sounded wonderful. Very important story there. All right, last one, last one. God judged Egypt for enslaving Israel, but does that mean God, that Jesus doesn't love Egypt, or does Jesus still love Egypt? Man, Isaiah was quick on the draw here. So let's give Isaiah a chance. He still loves Egypt. All right. Did you, did you want to say that to Abel or do you disagree? I agree. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jade and Toby. Appreciate it. Obviously, the answer to that is yes. And I want you to notice something too. 
God doesn't just try to establish a relationship in the Old Testament. Where did Jesus go when he was an infant and his life was threatened by Herod? Where did God send Jesus? He sent him to Egypt. Now, he didn't send him to Egypt to the Egyptians. There were Jewish communities in Egypt. Um, and that's likely where, where Mary and Joseph went. They went among the Jews. But they were still in the realm of Egypt. They were still under the authority of Egypt. They were still tolerated and under the auspices of the kingdom of Egypt. And even biblically uh, in Hosea, and it's quoted here in Matthew, where um, when Jesus, uh, after the death of Herod comes out, it was prophetically said, out of Egypt I have called my son. And then, of course, we know broadly, of course, God loves Egypt because He loves everyone. That's what John 3.16 teaches us. So, I want to just examine this uh, relationship with you for a while. You may not have thought of it before, and we're going to try to make some uh, application for this at the end, but it's going to get a little bit into history and and geography. Now, any of you who've studied the history of of Israel and the ancient world, you've you've seen this kind of display before. I've, I've highlighted Canaan there in purple. But you can see, God, the reason why it's the promised land is because it was at the crossroads of civilization. There were other places more rich in its fertile soils and things like that in the ancient world than than Canaan, all right? God did not give them Canaan because it was the best territory, uh, the best rich soil or, or anything. It was at the crossroads of ancient civilization, and God knew over time that these civilizations were going to interact. And if He put Israel, if He put His people at the very center of that, there would be a, a, a necessity that the rest of that world around there would have to be exposed to the things of God, and it would give Israel an opportunity to be the kingdom of priests that God wanted them to be, to be the ambassadors that He wanted them to be, not necessarily by sending missionaries, although He does that from time to time. Jonah went to Nineveh, and there's other stories, but for the most part, by establishing a community, no matter who came through, on the east you have, um, and you can't see it very well, I highlight it in yellow, but we know the Babylonians are over in the east, the Assyrians the Persians, all right? If they wanted to interact with Egypt, if they wanted to trade, if they wanted to communicate, if they wanted to make war, they had to go through Israel. They had to. Up in the north, you have the Hittites, the ancient kingdom of the Hittites. Okay, you don't know a lot about them, but they were a very massive major empire in the ancient world. Later on, it'd be the Greeks and the Romans. And again, if they wanted to interact with Egypt or if Egypt wanted to interact with them or if any of them wanted to communicate together, they had to go through the Valley of Jezreel. They had to go through the mountains of, of Megiddo. They had to go to the city of peace. They had to walk within sight of the temple of the living God. There was just no way of getting around it. The way the, the, uh, the geography and the um, I'm trying to use words I don't know, topography <laughs> of mountains and valleys, that's how God established it. And He made this uh, for a reason. And you have Egypt as one of those major powers that God established Israel as neighbors to. And there's a lot of ways that you can see this applied throughout the Scripture. Sometimes Israel did a good job. Sometimes they did a very bad job of representing God in the interactions of these major empires and the coming and going of history. Now, we know that Egypt is an ancient and enduring kingdom, much more than many other empires. For thousands of years, the cradle of civilization, Egypt had been part of that, and and the pyramids and all the architecture. Part of it was just the geography. Egypt has a a massive desert to the west, so the Libyan tribes could not really conquer Egypt. They do at one point when Egypt was very weak, but they had to cross the desert. It was very difficult. To the south, you have the mountains and the cataracts of the Nile. Very difficult for Ethiopia to conquer Egypt. They do at one point, um, but it was only for a brief period. To the um, north and to the east, you have these great oceans, or these seas, they're not oceans, these great seas. Back then, they didn't really have D-Day type invasions and craft that the, uh, the Greeks could go and conquer Egypt over the sea, or the um, Arabians could come across the sea. So they were protected at the north and the east. It was just this little bit of land at the Sinai Peninsula, you know, um, right there. That's all they had to defend. So they were very, very able to be isolated And their biggest problem was they would fight amongst themselves in Egypt. But they had a very ancient and enduring kingdom. And by the way, who is it that raises up kings and brings kings down? Who is it that determines that a kingdom can endure? God. 
So by the very fact that Egypt, yes, it's got a complex history, we're not going to get into it, but the very fact that it endured and it had all of this uh, stability is partly because God wanted it, God allowed it, God preserved it. I'm not saying that they were worshiping God and Ra is another name for Jehovah, I'm not saying that at all, but there was a plan of God in His preservation of Egypt, that's all I'm saying. Egypt is mentioned by far more times in the Bible than any other people group. More than the Philistines, more than the Babylonians, more than Moab or Edom. Um, he, Egypt, partly because of its ancient origins and also because of so many interactions, Egypt is mentioned quite frequently, over 600 times throughout your Bible. So God obviously has thoughts and connections with the context and themes related to Egypt. Now, I want to just say here as a disclaimer, I am talking about the, uh, a kind of a metaphor or a theme of Egypt. I'm not talking about geopolitical issues today. I'm not talking about Hosni Mubarak or Anwar Sadat or Sisi or Cleopatra, okay? Uh, we're just talking about the biblical theme of Egypt, all right? Also, throughout the biblical narrative, there is a unique relationship between the kingdom of Egypt, whoever that king was, when the Ethiopians conquered Egypt, they became the Egyptians. They were not the Ethiopians reigning over Egypt. The Ethiopians took the name Egyptians, and they took the name Pharaoh until they got kicked out. When the Hyksos, another tribe, conquered Egypt, they didn't become the Hyksos people of Egypt. They became the Egyptians. Am I confusing you? Am I going too fast? Are you with me? Okay, Edwin, are we all right? Carlos, not so much. All right. <laughs> no. Uh, again, uh, it's not a monolithic term. Just because you say Egyptian doesn't necessarily mean the same Semitic people for 2,000 years or multiple thousand years. There's a lot of complex history, but they've had a unique relationship with God's people. And there's something very interesting, too, when it comes to uh, God's description of um, the Sabbath when it comes to Egypt. In the Deuteronomy version of the Ten Commandments, this is Moses' kind of commentary on the Ten Commandments. He gives you the prologue, very similar to the one in Exodus, where the reason why God says, I'm giving you these laws and I want you to follow them is in verse 6, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And it's on that basis that God then gives the law and expects his people to follow. He says, I have set you free. I have purchased you. Therefore, I would like you to abide by these requirements, okay? And then when it comes to the Sabbath command, a few verses later, Moses writes through the Holy Spirit, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So in a way, every time we keep Sabbath today, we are supposed to remember Egypt. That's what Moses says. Every time we keep the Sabbath, we're to remember Egypt. Now, not necessarily the geopolitical place of Egypt, but what Egypt represents. We're to remember that we were slaves to sin. That Egypt stands as, a, as an illustration of the world and of Satan trying to keep us in slavery, but God sent a deliverer who set us free, and because of our thankfulness and gratefulness to God, we honor Him and worship Him every Sabbath day. Does that make sense? Well, Isabel, you and me, the rest, I don't know, but we got it. So there, again, we, I could do this all day of showing these you know, little nuances of how Egypt plays a role throughout the Scriptures. Now, most people, most Christians that have any uh, uh, Bible growing up, if you say, tell me what you know about Egypt in the Bible, it's generally negative. And, and most of the Bible, those 600 plus references to Egypt, most of them are negative. In, in other words, they're calling Israel back to remember their oppression in Egypt. So what do you know about Egypt? Oh, it was the place Israel was enslaved, they were oppressed, they were persecuted. Uh, Egypt is known for its stubbornness, just as an anecdote. It's interesting, it took 10 plagues to convince Pharaoh to let Israel go, right? That's a stubborn leader. 
ten plagues. It only takes seven plagues in the book of Revelation for God to end uh, the problem of sin, right? The seven bold judgments. God's able to do it in seven, but it took Pharaoh ten plagues. Again, I'm not making theology out of it. It's just interesting. So stubbornness, Egypt's known for stubbornness. And they're also uh, known for ignorance, particularly because of Pharaoh's statement here in Exodus 5.2. Moses comes and he says, Thus says the Lord, let my people go, as we sang together earlier. And this is Pharaoh's response. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? I don't know who he is. Who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice? I don't know the Lord. And, be, and, the, and besides, I will not li- let Israel go. So that sentiment of the God you're speaking of, I am ignorant of, I don't know who that is, has created a, a, a kind of a biblical uh, uh, identifier for what it means to be um, from the kingdom of Egypt. So they're known for all those qualities, oppression and slavery, persecution and ignorance, stubbornness. But that is not the only biblical narrative. It might be the major biblical narrative. But it's not the only biblical narrative. If it wasn't for that period of enslavement and the exodus and all that comes out of it, if we only knew of Egypt through the book of Genesis, we'd have a very different uh, connection biblically with what Egypt represents. Egypt was a place throughout the Bible, not just in Genesis, but in other, way, in other places, of refuge. It is where God sent Abram. All right? It's where Joseph, when Joseph is sold by his brothers, uh, Joseph goes through a rough time in Egypt, but eventually Joseph is elevated to be the leader of Egypt. And eventually Jacob and his whole family, all of Israel, for salvation purposes, leave Canaan and move into Egypt. Egypt was a place of refuge. It was a place of safety. It was a place that on other occasions God directed even Jesus himself would go to Egypt for a brief period to escape the violence of Herod. So there is a theme, a metaphor of Egypt also being a place of refuge. There's also a kinship with Egypt. By the way, if you're getting, wondering where I'm going, there's going to be a point to all this, all right? It's not just historical. This We're going to get there. Stay with me. There's a kinship. I mentioned Hagar earlier. One of the descendants of Abraham comes through an Egyptian, you know, Ishmael. And many Bedouin and Arab tribes still call Abraham their father. So there's a bloodline connection between that. Even, even in the Exodus, there were Egyptians who left with Israel and become absorbed into the community of Israel at the time of the Exodus. Solomon's first wife, his very first wife he marries, was the daughter of Pharaoh. It was a political marriage, and I'm not even saying it was a God-sanctioned thing. It's just a matter of the biblical record that the first marriage of Solomon doesn't talk about them having any children. Rehoboam was not the daughter, was not the son of, of the daughter of Pharaoh. But his first marriage was to an Egyptian. And the one that is even more direct, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, Joseph, when he arises to lead Egypt, who does he marry? He marries an Egyptian. We even know her name, Asenath. We know her name. He marries an Egyptian, which means that the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, are what? They're half Egyptian. Two of the 12 Jewish tribes that inherit land in Israel are half Egyptian. There is a blood, culture, and ethnic connection through the community of Israel with Egypt, through many levels. But the most direct and startling is when you remember that Ephraim and Manasseh are both half Egyptian. Interesting. Interesting. Egypt was also known by the Bible writers as being a blessed land. It's compared to the Garden of Eden. Lot himself, when Lot in Genesis 13 is separating from old Uncle Abram, it says he looked at the valleys of the plain and he saw Sodom, and he says it looked like the Garden of God, like Egypt. They considered Egypt to have the similar uh, blessings of what God originally intended in the Garden of Eden. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 19 with me. Isaiah 19, through the last series, 
of, of uh, sermons when I was focusing on the metaphors of the Bible. I was encouraging you to bring your Bibles, and it's a good habit to get into. Bring your Bibles to church. I want you to see in your own Bibles Isaiah 19, because it's very important. Isaiah 19. The whole chapter is dedicated to God's judgment, but also His desires for Egypt. And we're going to jump down to verse 19. Isaiah 19, 19. You there? This is what it says. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. The pillar will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and He will send them a Savior. You see that? Verse 20, God says He's going to send a Savior to Egypt and a champion, or a mighty one, some of your Bibles will say, and He will deliver them. Now, I want you to notice something. Isaiah is specifically uh, doing a play on words with the experience of Moses. Okay, Moses was the deliverer for Israel out of Egypt. Now Isaiah says someone is going to deliver Egypt itself. Now notice verse 21. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt. What was it that Pharaoh said? I don't know the Lord. Isaiah says the time is coming when they will say, I do know the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Uh, He will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They will even worship and sacrifice and and make offerings and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. The Lord will strike Egypt, verse 22 says, but strike them with healing so that they will return to the Lord and he will respond to them and heal them. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians, will, the Assyrians will come to Egypt, the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day Israel will be the third party. Again, Israel was the crossroads. Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. That's what Israel was supposed to be a blessing in the midst of the earth. Whom the Lord, verse 25, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people. Have you ever read this before? Have you ever seen this? Blessed is Egypt, they're my people. What is he talking about? And also Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel. My inheritance. Now, you read the commentaries and the historians, they say this is one of those conditional prophecies that never came true because Israel kept failing. But yet, it's still recorded here in Isaiah for us to learn from today. God still desires that a Savior go to Egypt. Does God love Egypt? And again, uh, stay with me on this if you're a little lost, okay? I'm going to tie it together in just a moment. Obviously, we know that God loves uh, all peoples, but here it says in Leviticus, you shall not take any vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the second great command that Jesus makes in the New Testament. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Leviticus says this is in the context of loving fellow Jews because he says the sons of your people. But when someone questioned Jesus about this, when Jesus said, you need to love your neighbor as yourself, and someone said, well, who is my neighbor? Remember, that's when Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan, who was not a Jew. So this did not, did not just necessarily apply only to between, Jew, uh, between Jews. And even later on in Leviticus, it makes the very same uh, a statement regarding the stranger. The stranger, the non-Jew, who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself because of what happened in Egypt. Because I loved you in Egypt, I wanted you to learn love in Egypt. When the alien, when the stranger, when the Egyptian is among you, you must love them. Very interesting. It was not by accident 
that God made Israel and Egypt neighbors. It wasn't by happenstance. It was not by accident that God sustained the ancient kingdom of Egypt. And it was not by accident that God sent his people at times as refuge, and they are also to act as ambassadors and even representatives of God into the nation and the people and the empire of Egypt. Now, I'm, I'm making a, a spiritual connection. Now, I, I, I believe that God loves the modern-day country of Egypt, okay? And I think He wants all people to be saved. But I'm trying to make a, 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 a spiritual connection to what this suggests to us, okay? What does loving Egypt mean, therefore, to us today? Well, there's a personal application. Obviously, uh, we need to learn. I mean, Egypt stands as a, as, as a symbol for Israel. He's, God's always saying, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Therefore, be careful. Don't worship idols. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, so be kind to the stranger. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Therefore, keep the Sabbath. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Therefore, watch out for the orphan and the widow. All throughout the Old Testament, you see that. So, on a personal note, we need to learn from the past but live in the present. That's what loving Egypt means, okay? It means that we need to be forgiving, Israel was to forgive Egypt, even though they were to remember what happened. They were still to forgive. There's lots of personal application. There's also prophetic application. Egypt is mentioned in the book of Revelation. So Egypt has a prophetic meaning and application. But really what I want to suggest and talk with you about is more what the practical meaning is for us today. What does it practically mean for me to love Egypt today in my context? I don't live in Israel I live in Cave Creek, okay? I pastor in Scottsdale. I still want blessings for everybody, but what does loving Egypt mean for me in Arizona? What does it mean for you? In Ar- what are the practical meanings of loving Egypt? First of all, it is a, a lesson and a metaphor that it is our job not just to be a community and a country and a people who stays within the confines of our blessed uh, area and say, let everything else happen, but I'm just going to stay safe in my, uh, in my church here and with my family, okay? Loving Egypt means you care about the salvation of the secular community around us. Egypt was a secular, in, in other words, they had religion, of course, but it was a man-made religion. It was a religion devoid of the knowledge of God, all right? Loving Egypt mean, means having hope for the atheist, the idol worshiper, and the non-believer in our community. That's what Egypt stands for. They were idol worshipers. They were not believers in the true God. In a sense, that's the, uh, again, the rejection of the truth of God. That would be the equivalent of a modern-day atheism. We are not to just write them off. We're not to ignore them. God has a plan for them, and He wants to use His people to be a bridge and a neighbor, and an opportunity to see the mercy of God in their life as well. Loving Egypt means lifting up Jesus as a Savior to all. To put it simply, loving Egypt means loving Phoenix. God did not put you in this community by accident. It is not by happenstance that you happen to live next to a city of five million people. We are not to ignore them. We are not to write them off. It is not by accident that every winter, two million additional people travel to Phoenix. We are placed at the crossroads of this community. We are given opportunity to impact and illustrate what the plan of God is in every opportunity that we interact with this community. That's what Israel was supposed to do with their neighbors. They were to represent the true God. They were to be ambassadors. They were to care about their neighbors. And God orchestrated times and ways where He sent His people, sometimes as partners, sometimes as lovers, sometimes as as refugees into Egypt. We have family in this community who are not serving the Lord. They're not just strangers. They're our very kin. How do you answer the question? Do you love Phoenix? Well, you don't have to say everything about it. The weather, the dust, the allergies. But do you love the people? 
because God wants you to. God is calling you to love the people. I want to show you just a little anecdote. I'm closing. I'm almost done. Another 20 minutes and we'll have this wrapped up. <laughs> this is just, this is a bonus. This is for free. No charge, okay? Um, I just want you to, to notice this. This is a modern day Google Maps way of getting from Jerusalem to Cairo. I've been on this road. I was there last year when Gene and I had the privilege, first time, to go to Egypt and Jordan and Israel. If you were to travel today from Jerusalem to Cairo, this is the general route you would take. You'd go south along the King's Highway from Jerusalem. You'd go east just slightly to the border of Israel, going south to cross Sinai, and then going slightly north and over to catch the main uh, hub of Egypt, which is Cairo. It's just a modern-day thing. Now, if you wanted to get from our church to downtown Phoenix, I want you to notice, you would go south, you would break east just a little bit to go down the 101, catch the 202, then go slightly north on that little jibe there to get to downtown Phoenix. It just so happens that even the geography matches up. No, I'm not saying that, that uh, next week we're going to start a ministry, we're all going to go downtown, and God wants us to love the entire community, right? We want to love all of Phoenix, Scottsdale included, even Mesa. We can love Mesa. That's not too far, all right? I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to leave you with this. And I know you've heard it, and I know... It sounds cliche, but you need to hear it again. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming soon. Did we learn anything from COVID? Are we learning anything about the instability of the world? Are we seeing more and more evidence that Jesus is coming soon? He's coming soon. And before that time comes, God is orchestrating ways for His people to love their neighbor and to show them they don't have to be afraid. They don't have to hate. They don't have to be divided. That there is a God who is building a better world for all of us. God wants to use us to reach Phoenix. In that day, Isaiah said, in that day, there will be a third party with Egypt and the other kingdom of Assyria. And we are to be a blessing on the earth, is what he says. Whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed is Egypt my people. Put Phoenix in there. Blessed is Phoenix, my people. I love them. In that day, Let's make it today, guys. Let's make it today. Lord, we don't know the whole story of the future. We don't know precisely what you have in mind for us tomorrow. We have the hope of your return and our eternal redemption. But Father, between now and then, you have recruited us, you have called us, you have converted us, you have empowered us, you have anointed us, you have raised us up to have an impact on our neighbors and on our world. Help us, Father, to not be afraid. Help us to not be embarrassed to bring our Bible to work. Help us to not be embarrassed to invite our neighbors and our friends to church. Help us not to be embarrassed to stand for our beliefs, 
to tell our employer, I keep the Sabbath. Please accommodate me so I can worship. Give us wisdom, Father. Give us passion. Help us to love our neighbor. And we'll give you all the praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.